good evening, everyone. Let's all go ahead and let's take our hymnal this evening. Turn to hymn number 420, Bringing in the Sheaves. Let's all stay in and sing this evening. Hymn number 420, Bringing in the Sheaves. Sowing in the morning, sowing seeds of kindness, sowing in the noontime and the new beginning, waiting for the harvest. teach us and preach us to us, Lord, that we're going to receive your word, Lord, we can apply it in our lives, Lord, that we can become better Christians, Lord, furthering your kingdom even, Lord, I pray. I pray you use this time. Lord, I love you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Let's go ahead. Let's take our hymnals. We're going to turn to hymn number 502, My Savior First of All, hymn number 502.
just want to encourage you, and I hope you do know him. And as we sing this last verse, through the gates to that city in a robe of spotless white, he will lead me where no tears will ever fall. Isn't won't that be a great time? Yes. I don't know about you, but that's an exciting time. I'm looking forward to that time. And I hope yeah. you know him tonight. And as we sing that last verse, think about all we're singing about. When we get there, mm -hmm. that one day, and we'll get to see him. <clears throat> I mean, can you, I don't know about you, I can't, I can't fathom it. I like to think I could, but I really can't. But I'll tell you what, I'm excited about it. Yeah, Let's go sing out nice and loud on that fourth verse. Through the gates to the city in a robe of spotless white, he will lead me where no tears will ever fall. Okay, 
how many unspoken requests we have for tonight. All as many of those. And, uh, and then I want to let you know, too, uh, one of our missionaries on the back of the prayer sheet, uh, there's a couple changes that will be coming up. I need to uh, just mention this uh, at Deacon's meeting. I'm sure they'll probably uh, decide to do what we would do. But Dave Herman is uh, retiring uh, from Rock of Ages. He's having some health issues and just decided to retire there from Rock of Ages. Uh, it'd be nice to pick up somebody uh, from Rock of Ages. They do, they used to just do prison ministries, but now they do all kinds of different types of ministries. Uh, they still do prisons. They hold revivals in the prisons. Uh, and uh, there's one, unfortunately, there's only, I think, one representative for the whole state of West Virginia. And there's a lot of prisons in West Virginia. So uh, they can always use more. They try to get uh, people from uh, the local churches when they are holding uh, revivals in a local prison. They try to get uh, folks there from churches to go with them. You have to be vetted and go through uh, a lot of process and stuff to get cleared to go into the prisons. Um, and you definitely, of course, when you're doing that, you want to be prayed up. But God can use you in a great way. But uh, pray for that ministry. Uh, they do a lot of good things. And uh, so you just need to pray for wisdom, what to do there. Hopefully we'll be able to pick up somebody else. Um, but pray for Dave Herman as he's having those health issues. Uh, also, uh, Aaron Bratton, we have enlisted uh, Israel. They are still ministering to the Jews. They are not in Israel. Uh, they are actually in Minnesota. Uh, so we need to pray for them. And uh, I don't know, you know how long that's been. might have been through uh, you know, since COVID started. And, and uh, it's hard to get into Israel. And you're actually not even allowed to be a missionary in Israel. You have to, it's a, a long process to get in there. Uh, and you have to, actually have a job doing something in the country and you can't technically do any type of mission work uh, you can be a witness like a, a citizen can but it's just it's really uh, kind of touch and go there is uh, a couple we had in here I think right be maybe right after COVID started or right before COVID started uh, that they are going to Israel they actually taught at an ambassador Baptist college so I might see if we can maybe get them back in if they're available uh, to try to get somebody there in the country. And, uh, but they are going into the country. That's their plan is to go and live there permanently. So anyway, just wanted to let you know about those couple changes there uh, on our missionaries. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and let's ask his blessing here uh, on these requests. And uh, as we go to God in prayer, remember again our unspoken and uh, pray for those who are sick. And we still have some that are, some folks that are traveling. Pray for us. We'll be traveling this weekend. And uh, next week we'll be gone. And uh, August is a busy month for us. We have, uh, of course, things come in for the garden, but we have you know, traveling, trying to get the parks for a couple times, uh, for some things up there. So if you would, just pray for us. But uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessing here on uh, these requests. And I'm going to ask uh, Jared if he and mine uh, praying for these requests. And you pray silently as he prays aloud. <clears throat> Dear Father God, we just come to you this evening's hour, God. God, we want to thank you, first of all, for the names that we've got to remove from our prayer list, God. But uh, God, we want to bring that you know each and every need that's on this uh, on our prayer list and the names. And God, we just want to pray for uh, Helmix, God, that uh, you would touch their family in a special way and heal them and, and the ones that are sick. And God, the one that's uh, dad that had a stroke, God, we just pray for them. And, and God, we just uh, want to pray for the one that had uh, cancer. And uh, God, just uh, we want to uh, pray for all those that we got several on our prayer list that uh, is battling cancer and, and different things. God, and we just uh, we want to lift their names up to you, God, that you know each of their needs. And God, that uh, if you would choose uh, to heal them, God, that uh, we would give you great honor and glory for it either way, God, whichever mm -hmm. you see fit. But God, that we may accept your will no matter what it is. God, we pray for. Uh, all those that are traveling, God, we pray for travel mercies, God, and we uh, pray that you would just continue to keep them safe as they travel out and about, and pastor as they go, and God and his family, we pray for them as they travel, and God, we just uh, want to pray for the service as well, God, and, uh, that you'd continue to lead it, that God, that uh, uh, your word might be convicting to the Christian, and God, the changing of lives to the unsaved, God, that you may change their lives, that their name might be written. 
in the Lamb's Book of Life tonight, God. And we just ask that you would uh, just continue to do a work here. And God, continue to use your people and help us to be obedient to your will for our lives. God, we just uh, want to say a prayer for, uh, again for all those that uh, are sick. And we want to pray you for all those that we've got to remove. And God, we just ask that you continue to go for both of this service. And we ask it all for your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, just a couple of announcements here. Uh, you can go through and look through the bulletin, but don't forget about uh, Caleb Rathen's baby shower coming up August 27th. And, uh, and then also, and all the information in there is in the bulletin for that. Uh, and then uh, this Saturday, there's a group that is going to uh, the fair down in Dublin, and uh, the cost will be leaving the church here at 4.30. They're going down and pass out tracks for about an hour uh, there at the fair. And cost to get into the fair is $7, and then if you'd like money for food or expenses, uh, just to make sure that you can take care of that as well. But uh, that would be a great opportunity uh, to use that time. And, you know, I think it's great if we can get uh, even to, uh, there's a lot of events where we can pass out gospel tracts. We usually do it for the Christmas parades, uh, the local parades, but you can also go to uh, football games, uh, whether they're the high school or the college, uh, you know, Concord or Virginia Tech. There's a lot of things we can do uh, to get the gospel out. So uh, the need is great. And the Bible tells us that the fields are wide and the harbors, but the labors are few. And, and uh, one thing the devil wants to do is get us so busy, we don't get time to do those things. So we just need to uh, make time and schedule time for stuff like that. But we always ought to be a witness for the Lord. But that's all the announcements I have. So let's all stand. Let's welcome one another to our service, and then we'll prepare for our Wednesday night offering. <laughs>
chapter number 6. Hebrews chapter number 6. We'll complete, Lord willing, complete chapter 6 here this evening. We've been going through a study in the book of Hebrews as the Lord leads. And, and uh, I'll cut it off whenever the Lord just tells me to preach on something different. I may do that and then come back to the book of Hebrews if, if that's what the Lord wants. But the Hebrews is a tremendous book. It's a great uh, book of encouragement, but it's also a great book uh, about self-examination and how we need to examine ourselves in the faith. And uh, there's some wonderful, wonderful passages here. It's uh, this is not a milky book. It's not a book that you would go through and you know we talk about milk. Uh, for you know, like new Christians, they desire the sincere milk of the word that they may grow thereby. This is not a book. It has some milk in it, but there's a lot of meat in this book. This is for uh, this book is to help believers mature in Jesus Christ. It encourages us to grow in the faith and not uh, be stagnant in our Christian life. And there's a lot of wonderful things that we're reminded of here through this book. And what we've done so far. Just to kind of review here briefly, uh, in the first few chapters, we've seen the superiority of Jesus Christ because of the Word. Christ, what we find throughout the whole book of Hebrews, the theme of the book of Hebrews, is Christ is better than, and then you can fill in the blank, He's better than everything. He's better than, we found that He was better than the angels, we found that He was better than Moses, and of course, remember, these are the Hebrew Christians, so they looked uh, to uh, angels sometimes for uh, maybe getting a message, kind of like when uh, Daniel had prayed and, and he received a message from an angel. He, they looked to things like that. They looked to Moses, and Christ is better than Moses. Uh, they looked to Joshua. Christ is better than Joshua. We saw that. And then also they looked to Aaron, and Christ is better than the priesthood of Aaron. And the next chapter we're going to get into where Christ is better than than the priesthood of even Melchizedek, who uh, kind of is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he's better than all of these things. And uh, something else that we've learned back in chapter 2 is that we can count, and I'm so, so thankful for this, we can count on Christ understanding whenever we go through times of suffering and times of great trial. Right. Uh, Christ understands what we're going through. He is there. He is able to help us in a time of need. Something else that we've learned is that since Christ was faithful, because he was faithful, we also ought to be faithful. We also learned that we can only enter into God's rest through faith. That's the only way you can do that. And then uh, we also learned we ought to give all of our energies to make sure we are growing in Christ to become spiritually mature. It talks at the end of chapter 5 about the dangers of being uh, lazy uh, uh, we become lazy listeners sometimes. And so we ought to give all of our energies to, to strive to be faithful. And then we spent the last three weeks on a, probably the most difficult passage in all the Bible is in the first part of chapter 6. And uh, there's a lot of disagreement on this. Uh, but one thing we ought to know for certain after studying that passage is one thing is dead sure. A Christian, somebody who is saved, cannot lose their salvation. Right. There's no way they can lose their salvation. But something else we also ought to have learned, it is very possible for someone to think they are saved and to truly be deceived. And that was the stern warning that, and of course I believe Paul is the author of the book of Hebrews. This is one book we really don't know who the author is for certain. doesn't matter. The Holy Spirit is always the author of the Bible. And uh, so the stern warning we were given there was for that reason, is that our hearts not deceive us. And tonight what we're going to do is we're going to learn that in times of discouragement and times of doubt, because we all go through them, uh, we all have them, in times of discouragement and doubt, we ought to lay hold upon the hope that we have in Christ because of the promises we find in God's Word. Boy, I tell you what, those precious promises. If you have not learned to pray and claim the promises of God, I want to encourage you to do that. You want to see God answer your prayers? One thing God loves to hear is his word repeated back to him. He loves it. 
He loves his word. Matter of fact, we talked about there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And that the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. You know, there's, at the name of Christ, everything in heaven is going to be subject to it. But there's only one thing that is magnified above all his name. And that is the word of God. That's how important the word of God is. That's why you hear me over and over again stress the importance of getting God's word in your heart. Some people don't read very well. Well, I was right there with you. I didn't read very well for many, many years. But you know, one thing that's true, and I've heard this from a lot of folks, the more you read the Bible, the better of a reader you become. It's just the way it is. And uh, if you don't read very well, we live in a time, uh, a blessed time of technology. Now, technology's got a lot of you know, junk in it, but it's also got a lot of good things. We can hear the Bible. Uh, if you don't read the Bible, you can at least hear it. And now, uh, I've seen this one on YouTube. I used to listen... Uh, to Alexander Scorby. Sometimes I'd listen to it when I'm driving down the road and listen to the Bible. But uh, now it has it where you can actually read along with it as he's reading it. It actually, it'll like turn the page for you as you go through it. And I thought, wow, this is incredible. And I don't do that when I'm driving down the road and sit there and read it. <laughs> but I still listen to it. It's just, that's another advantage that we have. This is just the day and time we live in. But we're going to learn tonight about how important it is to just cling to that hope and also about the importance of the promises of God's word. So we're going to start reading here in uh, verse number 9 of chapter 6. And we see just mainly three points here. There's a little phrase I want to point out to you at the end of this passage. But verse 9 says, But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you. Now remember, Paul has just kind of, kind of taken them through the fire here with the word of God. I mean, he's taken them through some pretty deep stuff, giving him some very severe warnings. And he says, but beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. That last part there, though we thus speak, he says, even though I just covered these things that are very serious, these very stern warnings, we're persuaded better things of you. He gets in verse 10, he says, for God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints, and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of the hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee, and so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men barely swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who hath fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And again, this chapter is leading us into chapter 7 about how Christ is better than even Melchizedek. But I want to draw your attention there to a little phrase we find in verse 18. And right there towards the end of the verse, lay hold upon the hope. That's the title of the message, that lay hold upon the hope. That's what God wants us to do. Lay hold of that thing. Don't let go of it. And I think there's some things that we can learn here tonight that will be a help to us. And let's pray and we'll get right into it. Father, we thank you so much for the scriptures. I pray that you will open our hearts and our understanding now. And, uh, Lord, we just thank you for the powerful word of God. Thank you, Lord, that it is able to change our lives. And, Lord, I think one of the first things we ought to acknowledge is that without your help, we can't understand it. And, uh, Lord, it is a spiritual book, and it takes some spiritual guidance to open our understanding and to help us. So, Lord, we, we depend upon the Holy Spirit of God to help us in these things. And, Lord, I pray that you would do that. I pray that you might... Uh, Lord, light a fire under us if we need that. I pray that you might lift us up, Lord, if, if there are any amongst us that feels fallen, feels discouraged, feels down and out. And Lord, I pray if there be any also in our service that's not sure if heaven is their home, that tonight will be the night they get saved. 
And uh, Lord, what a joy it is to know Christ as our Savior, to know this world is not all there is. That, Lord, we have a, a grand and glorious home waiting for us in heaven. And, uh, Lord, we are looking forward to seeing your face, seeing not just your smile, but seeing, as we sang earlier, the print of nails in your hands. And, uh, Father, we just ask you to bless us now. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, I think in this passage here, the first thing that I think we can see in verses 9 through 12 uh, something that we all ought to do is learn to be a good follower. Learn to be a good follower. This is one of the most basic things we teach little kids. Uh, you know, and I saw them out here at Cold Wars. You had little small groups. They had them walking you know, from one building to the next. And they'd have them follow a single file line. And you always have that one child. There's sometimes more than one. But there's always that one who's doing their own little thing. They're just missing Miss Independent Spirit or Mr. Independent Spirit, and uh, they're just out there doing their own little thing, or they're just in La La Land, not paying attention to what anybody else is doing, and they get caught looking, and everybody else is going this way, and they're just standing there doing this. You always have that. But you know, as adults, we do the same thing, and we don't even realize it. We need to be good followers, and we need to learn to be good followers. Well, good followers of what? Well, after the stern warning that Paul gives in the first part of the chapter, he is leaving them with some wonderful encouragement. And that's always good is to leave people on a positive note. There are things that accompany salvation. Look at verse 9 and 10. He says, But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation. Now, that doesn't mean we are saved by faith plus something else. Just because it says that these things accompany salvation. That's not what that means. We are saved by grace through faith, plus nothing, minus nothing. That's it. It's only because of God's grace he gives us the faith that we're saved, and, and we exercise that faith and trust him as our Savior. That is the only way anybody has ever been saved. Old Testament and New Testament, we are all saved the same way. It is by faith. It is not... Some people teach, and even in some Baptist churches today, and they're just dead wrong because they don't understand dispensationalism in the Bible. They try to teach that in the Old Testament they were saved by faith plus works. No, no, no. The works proved their faith. Right. Just like in the New Testament, our works prove our faith. That's what it means. We are persuaded better things of you, things that accompany salvation. If your salvation doesn't have anything accompanying it, better check up on it. When you get saved, you get a new nature. And guess what? God is, he is there. He is a co-laborer together with you. We now can do all things, as the Bible says, through Christ, which does what? Strengthens us. He equips us to do the work that he wants us to do. So there are things that accompany salvation. They don't help us get saved. They just accompany salvation because Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So therefore, we want to be obedient because we love him. Now, in verse 10, it tells us exactly what these things are. It says, for God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. It is our works that accompany salvation. Jesus said, uh, talked about, let, he said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good, work. good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Over in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, we always quote that. I just quoted it a moment ago. But we don't quote verse 10, which tells us that we are saved unto good works. There's a reason. It is taught in every book in the New Testament that works should accompany our salvation because that is the proof of our faith. It's not what we're saved by, but it's just the evidence of our faith. It's a genuine faith. And he says here that they had not only work and labor of love, but he mentions something very specifically that they did. He says here, which hath showed towards his name in that ye have ministered to the saints. You know how important it is to minister to the saints? To meet the needs of one another? This is why it's very important. Matter of fact, uh, since we're here in Hebrews, just turn over, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 13. Now remember, we're talking about lay hold upon the hope. And we have to learn to be good followers. But Hebrews chapter 10, look if you would in verse 23. 
We're talking about ministering here to the saints now. It says, let us hold fast. There it is again, talking about holding. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. And we're going to find out about the promises here, the promises of God in just a second. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Now you see that? We are to provoke one another. It's kind of like uh, you get one of those uh, those big old needles. You know how you get a needle? Sometimes you see it in an old movie, you know, and they take off. Provoke unto love and good works. That's what, come on, you just prod along. You can do it. Come, and people are like, I don't want to. Yeah, but whoa, okay, yeah, I get the message. That's what it's talking about. We're going to provoke unto love and good works. We're going to kind of move each other along. And then look what it says here in verse 20, uh, 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. Who does not need encouraged? I think we all do. But exhorting one another, and then look at the last part. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. This is what we are to do, and especially in the day and time in which we live, this is what we're supposed to be doing. We are to provoke unto love and good works. We are to exhort one another. And we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Why? Because we all need this. We must learn to be good followers. And we it says back in chapter 6 again that the very specific thing, the very good work that they did was that they ministered to the saints and do ministry. It was an ongoing, continual thing. And Paul is commending them for what they've done. But he says here in verse 11, he says, And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. In other words, don't quit. Faithful diligence in obeying Christ brings full assurance in partaking of Christ. Let me say that again. Faithful diligence in obeying Christ brings full assurance in partaking of Christ. This is the confidence that was talked about in chapter 3. That that confidence was mentioned twice. We ought to have confidence that we're saved. And the only thing that can bring that confidence is full obedience to Jesus Christ. That's where we can have the confidence. And I've always been very concerned about Christians who are so disobedient. They don't have any evidence of living the Christian life in their life, yet they look back to a time when they said, I've prayed a prayer, or I've done this, or I've done that. A prayer does not save you. It is faith in your heart that God sees that saves you. Yes, you will call upon the name of the Lord. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But when God sees that faith, you get that new nature. Everything changes at that point. And that's when you desire to start doing things that God wants you to do. And you desire to obey the Lord and follow him as he tells you to go. So that's the first. We talk about being a good follower. The first person we ought to follow is, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. He goes on here in verse 12. He says that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So Jesus wants us to follow him. Jesus said, follow me, over almost 20 times in the Gospels alone. Follow me. God wants us to follow our, our great example, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, And then it says here in verse 12 that we are to follow those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. You know, this is talking about having heroes of the faith. You ought to have some heroes of the faith. People who uh, have gone on before you, they might even still be living now, but they're just a living testimony. They have been a great example. And this is why it's so wonderful uh, if you have you know, Bible time at home, and I encourage you to do that, but get some good godly missionary stories from years gone by. Get those and read those missionary stories to your kids because your children need that example. And I guarantee you, as you read through those stories, you're going to be blessed. You're going to be encouraged. I still remember about George Mueller and how uh, here was a guy who, uh, back in London, he had prayed. He took care of a large orphanage, and he prayed and thanked God for the meal they were about to eat. Now, you don't know the story yet. 
The story is this. They were all sitting at the table and there was no food on the table. They didn't have any food to serve. But he thanks God for the food they're about to eat. This was a man of prayer and a man of faith. And when he got done praying, there was a knock at the front door of the orphanage. And there was a, I think it was a bread truck, if I remember correctly, a bread truck that had crashed outside. They hit something, they couldn't go anywhere, and the bread was going to rot, and they had to find something to do with it. So guess what? They took it into the orphanage. And there was their meal. I'm telling you what, you read stuff like that over and over again, and what's it going to do to your faith? Boom! Right. People who through faith and through patience inherited the promises of God. God promised he will never leave us nor forsake us. Uh, the, we've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. I mean, there's so many promises in God's word. And this is just such a, a boost to your faith when you read wonderful stories like that. I think of a man, he actually, his name was John Hyde. They called him Praying Hyde. And uh, this was a man of prayer. And uh, he would pray sometimes. They thought he was asleep sometimes. But he would pray. We sing the song, Sweet Hour of Prayer. But we have a struggle with five minutes of prayer, don't we? I mean, if we're honest with ourselves, we do. But we sing Sweet Hour of Prayer. But praying high, he could pray almost sometimes 24 hours straight. Now, you think of how needy we are. Do you think you could pray for 24 hours? If you listened to all your needs, you could. But the problem is we have not because we ask not. We don't pray for everything we need. Sometimes we pray and we think, well, I don't know if I need anything else. Well, that's why it's called intercessory prayer. You start praying for the needs of others. You start praying on their behalf. Anyway, this man, John Hyde, he would pray and pray and pray. And uh, I remember one time he got so burdened for lost souls, he prayed that God would help him win. If I remember correctly, it was one soul a week that God would help him to win. And next year he got convicted because God answered his prayer. He was able to personally lead 52 people to Christ that year. And I might be getting the story a little bit wrong here. But uh, the next year he got convicted and he, and he felt God wanted him to lead twice as many. So that's what he did. He would pray and God led him to win twice as many people to the Lord. The next year he got convicted again and he wanted to win twice as many as that year. So that's four times of what he led the first time. And I'll tell you what, he, he tells story after story in that little book about, it's called Praying High is the name of the book. You look it up, and it's a great book to read. But he talks about how God answered prayer, and there's so many other things in there. It'll do wonders for your faith. It'll boost your faith. That's what he's talking about here in verses 9 through 12. We ought to learn to be good followers, first of all, of Jesus Christ. For consider him who endured such contradictions and sinners against himself, lest ye also be weary to think in your minds. We ought to consider him, but we also ought to consider great uh, Christians of the faith. And God is no respecter of persons. They're made of the same stuff you and I are. They just trust the Lord. That's what we need to be encouraged to do, is just simply trust the Lord and be a good follower. And what will happen if we become a good follower? Well, we'll inherit the promises of God. Now, the question is this. If we are to be, if we are to follow good examples shouldn't somebody be looking to us to follow us who is looking at us to follow us who is following our example of faithfulness who is following our example of prayer who is following our example of our walk with God somebody ought to be and you never know who's looking at you and who's watching There was a great uh, old gentleman. He was one of the deacons in our church when I first started going to church. Kind of a gruff personality. But there's one thing I always remember about him. He loved to sing. Brother Rollins, he just loved to sing. And I loved hearing his bass voice. He'd get up there and he'd growl in that microphone. Or he'd get way down there. And I loved hearing that bass voice. But you know, sometimes he'd sing those old hymns of the faith. And this man... He was just so gruff. I mean, he intimidated people. He was so gruff. Boy, he'd just start crying. He's singing about Christ and singing about his love and his sacrifice. And there was one thing that I took notice of early on as a young Christian is that I knew every time I was going to be at church, I knew who else was going to be there. He was going to be there. 
And he wasn't the only one. There was many others. Many others. Just faithful saints of God you could count on, just like I could count on the Lord, just like I count on anything else. They were there, didn't matter what was going to happen. They were faithful. They were faithful to God in their service, faithful to God in other things. But we need to look to examples, and then other people need to look to us as an example. So we need to learn to be good followers. But secondly, what we need to do is we need to wait. Once we learn to be a good follower, we need to wait for the promise. We heard, uh, I read there in Hebrews chapter 10 about the promises. Sometimes we know the promises of, of God's word, but we don't wait for the promise of God's word. In verses 13 through 15, look what it says here. It says, For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Now, God's promise to Abraham was about what? What was his promise to Abraham? His seed, child. It was his seed. that His seed was going to multiply and replenish the earth. Now, Abraham, we know he was up in years. He got to 90 years old. How many children did he have when he was in his 80s? None. So guess what Abraham did? He did the same thing you and I do. He kind of took matters into his own hands. Thought, well, God may want us to do this. So that's when he listened to his wife and he took uh, Hagar. Uh, if, I hope that got that right. And uh, sometimes that, it's dangerous to think on your feet. <laughs> so... But uh, he got Hagar and had a child with her. And, of course, his name was Ishmael. And that's where all the Arabs come from is from the line of Ishmael. And God even said, I'm going to bless his seed because it came from Abraham. But he's not the promised seed. The promised seed was going to be Isaac, who was born when he was 100 years old. And that's why there's always been battles throughout history between the Jews and the Arabs. And it's been because of that conflict ever since then. You wonder where it came from? That's where it started. That's where it came from. And it's going to continue on down through the years until Christ comes back. But anyway, uh, Isaac was the promised seed. And finally, as he waited for the promise, then what did God tell uh, Abraham to do? Isaac now is grown. He's a young adult at this time. And what did God tell Abraham to do? Sacrificing. He said, I want you to go to this mountain. It's about three days' journey from you. And I want you to take your son, your only son, Isaac. Ishmael's 12 years older than Isaac. But he says, I want you to take your son, your only son, Isaac. And I want you to sacrifice him in the place I'm going to tell you there. Abraham makes this journey for three days. Doesn't say a word. Doesn't say a word. Doesn't say a word to Isaac. Doesn't say anything when they get there and they get to the foot of the mountain. They start. They, he tells the uh, other people, he says, well, you all stay here and me and the lad, we're going to go sacrifice yonder. They're walking up on top of the mountain. Well, Isaac's a pretty smart young guy. And he says, well, Father, where's the lamb for the sacrifice? And all Abraham tells him is he says, God will provide himself a lamb. God will take care of it. You see, Abraham believed the promise of God that even if he had to kill his only son Isaac, that God's promise was still going to be sure and that somehow, someway, God was going to raise Isaac from the dead and that his seed was still going to be as the sand of the seashore, as the stars of the sky. He believed the promises of God. That was the promise that was given to Abraham. But look here, if you would, at verse uh, 13. It says, for when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. The Lord made his own character the guarantee of his promise. And you know, that's the way he, it is all through the Bible. It is God's character that is the guarantee that's going to fulfill that promise. Now, we know that Abraham believed God. But notice what happens here in verse 15. It says, and so after he had... Patiently endured. When did Abraham's seed become as the sand on the seashore? When did his seed become as the stars of the sky? After he's dead. It was after he's dead. He didn't see it fulfilled, but he saw it a long way off through eyes of faith. And guess what? We sing the song, we teach it to children. Father Abraham... 
had many sons, and many sons had father. Y'all know that song? And I always love doing that with the kids, and we we do it like slow motion where you do you know right arm, and you start doing your right arm, and then you do left, and you do it slow motion. Father Abraham. And you do that just for a little while, and then you do it super slow <laughs> speed, and that's when they love it. And then you start doing all the motions with it and going around, spinning around, and they, the kids just get crazy with it. But you know that song is very biblical, very biblical, because we are all the seed. Because we are children of the promise, we are all children of Abraham. We are a part of the sand of the seashore. We are a part of the stars of the sky. Why? Because he patiently endured. Sometimes we get ahead of God, don't we? We kind of jump the gun. Abraham, in the face of pain, in the face of doubts, and despite what he felt, he still remained steadfast in his faith. And I like what it says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. It says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. We can never rush God's timing. God's timing is perfect. Wait for it. Wait for it. It's worth waiting for. This example that he gives to us here encourage these Hebrew believers to resist the impulse to slip back into doubts, to slip into fears, and depend, and it taught them to depend on what God says in his word. So we need to learn to be good followers. We need to wait for the promises. And then he closes out the chapter here with the encouragement that we need to rest in the hope of Christ and in his promises. He says here in verse 16, For men barely swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel. Now let me tell you what immutability means. Immutable just simply means it, can't, it doesn't change. It's unchanging. That's what immutable means. So it says the immutability of his counsel. His counsel does not change. His word does not change. Okay. Does time change? Yes. Does culture change? Yes. Does God's word change? No. It is the same yesterday, today, and forever, just like our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Because Amen. the written word is a great picture of the living word, Jesus Christ himself. Right. So it's the immutability of his counsel confirmed by an oath. Then verse 18, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation. Now, that word consolation means comfort. We're not just going to have any comfort. We're going to have strong comfort. From what? From two immutable things. Well, what are the two immutable things? Well, the two immutable things, one was given in verse 17. It's his promise. It was his oath. It was his word and what he said. And the other immutable thing was this. It is impossible for God to lie. God cannot lie. God can do anything he wants to do, but one thing he has limited himself in is the fact that he is truth. In him is no darkness at all. He cannot lie. The Bible also says he cannot deny himself. I get asked this question from time to time from people who are skeptics. It's like, they ask questions like, well, uh, can God do anything? And my answer is not yes. My answer is yes, except for what he limits himself to do, because I know what these verses say. And they say, well, if God can do anything, can he make a rock so heavy that even he can't lift it? Now, that goes back to Timothy who's talking about these foolish questions. That's a foolish question. And I say, well, God can do anything he wants to do except for the limitations he puts on his own character. And that's one of the limitations he puts is he cannot lie. He cannot break his word. You can count on the word of God. That's what he's trying to tell us. This ought to give us strong comfort. It says here at the end of verse 18, who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us. And then he gets here, uh, before we get into verse 19 and 20 and finish this up, I want you to, we, we think about the promises here. Turn, if you would, to 2 Peter. Hold your place here. We'll be right back here, and then we'll close it out. 2 Peter chapter 1. Think about the promises. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 3. Just a 
few pages over there from where you're at in Hebrews towards the end of the book. 2 Peter 1 and verse number 3 says, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and what? Precious promises. That by these, these promises, ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. You know, you think about the promises of God. What are some promises God has given to us? Salvation. Salvation. We're saved by grace through faith. We didn't have to do anything for it. He paid the price for it. What's another promise? Home in heaven. What is it? Home in heaven. Uh, we're promised a home in heaven. Yes. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. Yes. What's another? His return. His return. He's coming back for us. He's not just going there and leave us here. He's coming back for us. What's another one? Eternal life. I'll never leave you nor for safety. What's another one? Eternal life. What's another one? There's all kinds of them. I mean, if the Bible's full of promises, that's what I'm saying. If you haven't learned, to t as you're praying, to find some promises of God's Word and then just repeat those promises back to God. God, your Word says, and I like the promises that says that God is walking to and fro throughout the whole earth, seeking for them whom He can show Himself strong. Never have. That's in the Old Testament. I say, Lord, here I am. Your word says you're seeking for someone to show yourself strong in their behalf. Here I am. Show yourself strong on my behalf. God answers prayer. Guess what he does? He comes through. It's amazing what he does. He says no good thing will I withhold. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Lord, am I walking uprightly? Am I doing what you want me to do? If I'm not, please show me. If I am, your word says you're not going to withhold any good thing from me. If this thing I'm praying for is not good for me, I don't want it. If it is good for me, then I'm praying for it. And your word promises that I'll get it because you say you will hold no good thing from me if I'm walking uprightly. Claim the promises of God. That's how we get our prayers answered. So back in chapter 6, he closes out here. He's talking about these great promises that will give us comfort. But look at how he closes this out. Paul closes with how Christ is so dependable. Verse 19, he says, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. He is sure and steadfast. That Amen. anchor is not moving anywhere. Yeah. It's not going anywhere. The winds may blow, the storms may crash, all these other things going around us, but that anchor is sure and steadfast. It's not moving. We can depend on Jesus Christ. Notice what else he says here. He says, and which entereth into that that within the veil. What he's talking about here is because of the sacrifice Jesus Christ Amen. made for us on the cross, he brought us within the veil Amen. so we can come into God's presence. If you ever came into God's presence in the Old Testament and you were not, God did not admit you to come in, you would be struck dead. That's why only the high priest out of the millions in Israel, only one man was able to go into the Holy of Holies. But when Christ was uh, crucified there on the cross, and when the, the veil of the temple, the Bible says, was rent in two, rent in twain, from the top to the bottom, that means God did it. That veil is no longer there. Now we can enter into the Holy Amen. of Holies because when we come to Jesus Christ and we get saved, we are now a priest unto God, just like the Old Testament priest. Amen. We can now come into his presence immediately. That was made possible because of Jesus Christ. And then look how he finishes here in verse 20. He says, Whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made him high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Amen. He is a faithful high priest. The Old Testament high priest made it possible for the children of Israel to have access to God, but also he, is, he was the go-between. He was the go-between between God and man. The Bible talks about him, the man Christ Jesus. Yeah. He is that, that one that made it possible for, he's kind of the bridge between us and God. And it has to go through Jesus Christ. There's no other way we can get to God the Father but through Jesus Christ. We don't go through Mary. We don't go through the baptistry. We don't go through any other way. We go directly through the Lord Jesus Christ. That is how we get to the Father. And it's all made possible because of Jesus. That is the hope that he wants us to lay hold of as Christians. We need to learn to be a good follower. 
Follow Jesus Christ. Follow the examples of other saints of the faith. And then we need to make sure that we, we cling to the promises of God's word. Claim those promises. Cling to them. And then once we do that, we need to make sure that we rest in the hope that we have in Jesus Christ because of the promises. Because he cannot lie. Because he doesn't change. Because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's the encouragement he has for all believers. And I trust and hope that you will do that. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, we want to give you an opportunity to get that settled here tonight. Let's all stand and we'll have a word of prayer. If you would say, I don't know for sure if I die this minute, I would go to heaven. You can do that. We're going to give you an opportunity. You can come forward. You can actually pray right where you're at in your pew. And the Bible teaches us that we're all sinners. Every one of us is a sinner. We look at sin as a big sin, little sin. God looks at all sin as an abomination. doesn't matter how big, how little it is. It's all an abomination to him. Even to them who know to do good and do it not, the Bible says it is sin. So there's not a one of us better than anybody else. And because we're sinners, we all deserve the same thing. We deserve hell and a lake of fire. That's not the good news. The good news is Christ paid the price in full. His blood was perfect. His sacrifice was made there on Calvary. And what we have to do is just believe what the Bible says and put your faith and trust in Him, not in yourself, in Him. And I remember praying this prayer when I was a little boy and just and I didn't know exactly how to pray. I just said, Jesus, I don't want to go to hell. And I'm asking you to save me and take me to heaven because I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve that. Would you please forgive me? And it wasn't exactly in those words, but it was something like that. And I'm here to tell you, it was the faith God saw in my heart. That's what saved me. And that's what can save you right now. If you've never done that, won't you pray and trust Christ as your Savior? And if you have, let's learn to be a good follower of Jesus Christ. Let's cling to the promises of God. And let's lay hold on that hope that we have in Jesus. Father, we ask you to bless this invitation time now. Thank you so much for the wonderful encouragement we find from the Word of God. Thank you for the great promises that we have. And Lord, that we do have an anchor that's sure and steadfast. And Lord, even though the storms of life may change and, and governments may change and, and uh, different people may be in power, Lord, you're the same today, yesterday, and forever. And Lord, I thank you so much that you are just consistent and faithful and we can always depend on you. Lord, our hearts are so fickle. They go up and down. We have good days and bad days. And, but, Lord, you can help us through every one of them. Help us to learn to just be consistent as you're consistent. Help us to, to look to other great examples of the faith. And, and Lord, help us to just follow in their, in their steps, their example. And then, Lord, I pray you will help us to be a good example to others as well. And, Father, may we always hide the promises of your word in our heart that we not sin against you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 397, we're going to sing a few verses here. God spoke to your heart, won't you come? 397 in your hymn book.
And you know, sometimes when you feel like just kind of letting down just a little bit, that's a good one there to sing. Though no one join me, still I will follow. And uh, it's got to be a decision we make in our heart and life. Well, God bless you. Thank you so much for being here. We're going to close here in a word of prayer. And it's good to see you. Harry. I'm going to ask if you would close us in prayer, please. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this another day of life and the privilege and the opportunity to have you gathered in your house. Thank you for this time, for the long message. And in Hebrews, we've been stirred and challenged from this book. And the last is goes forth. And not only for this book, but from all of your word. Thank you for him as he leads. We expect the interest and excited for your family. Pray for our church family. Thank you for the success and surgery. Continue to heal according to your own. Prayers, uh, Father, just continue to be able to hearts and lives. Many on our prayer list here tonight. Some special loving services this Sunday. Thank you for him giving your son. Through him, we can truly be saved. I'm going to go to a separate home. We'll just back the next point in time. Of course, in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great evening.